Definiteness of purpose is the starting point of all achievement. Definiteness of purpose, combined with PMA, is the starting point of all worthwhile achievement. Remember, your world will change whether or not you choose to change it, but you have the power to choose its direction. You can select your own targets. When you determine your definite major aims with PMA, there is a natural tendency for you to use seven of the success principles. A. Personal initiative. B. Self-discipline. C. Creative vision. D. Organized thinking. E. Controlled attention. Concentration of effort. F. Budgeting of time and money. G. Enthusiasm. Robert Christopher had definiteness of purpose with PMA. Now let's see how the natural tendencies for these additional principles manifested themselves in this success story. For like many boys, Bob's imagination was stimulated while he read Jules Verne's thrilling imaginative story, Around the World in 80 Days. Bob told us, I used to daydream a great deal, but when I grew older, I read two books on motivation. Think and Grow Rich, and The Magic of Believing. Around the world in 80 days. Now why couldn't I go around the world on $80? I believed that any given aim could be accomplished if I had faith and confidence that it could be. That is, if I started from where I was to get where I wanted to be. I thought, others had worked on freighters to earn their transatlantic passages and hitchhiked all over the world. So why couldn't I? And then Bob took his fountain pen from his pocket and wrote on a piece of notepaper a list of the problems with which he would be faced. Also, he made notes of what he thought were workable answers to each. Now, Bob Christopher was an expert photographer, and he did have a camera. It was a good one at that. When he reached his decision, he went into action. A. Entered a contract with Charles Pfizer Company, a large pharmaceutical company to collect soil samples from the various countries he intended to visit. b. Obtained an international driver's license and a set of maps in return for a promised report on Middle East road conditions. c. Picked up Siemens papers. d. Obtained a letter from the New York City Police Department to prove that he had no criminal record. e. Arranged for a youth hostel membership. F. Contacted a freight airline which agreed to transport him by plane over the Atlantic on his promise to obtain photographs which the company intended to use for publicity. And when his plans were completed, this young man of 26 left New York City by plane with $80 in his pocket. Around the world on $80 was his definite major aim. And here are a few of his experiences. Had breakfast at Gander, Newfoundland. How did he pay for it? He photographed the cooks in the kitchen, and they were pleased. Bought four cartons of American cigarettes at Shannon, Ireland that cost him $4.80. At that time, cigarettes were as good as money as a medium of exchange in many countries. Arrived in Vienna from Paris. The fee? One carton of cigarettes to the driver. Gave the conductor four packs of cigarettes to take him from Vienna to Switzerland on a train through the Alps. Rode a bus to Damascus. A policeman in Syria was so proud of the picture that Bob had taken of him that he ordered the bus driver to take him. Took a photograph of the president and staff of the Iraq Express Transportation Company. This earned him a ride from Baghdad to Tehran. In Bangkok, the owner of a very fine restaurant fed him like a king, for Bob gave him the information he wanted, a detailed description of a specific area and a set of maps. Was brought from Japan to San Francisco as a crew member of SS The Flying Spray. Around the world in 80 days? No. Robert Christopher went around the world in 84 days, but he did accomplish his objective. He went around the world on $80. And because he had definiteness of purpose with PMA, he was automatically motivated to use an additional 13 of the 17 success principles to achieve his specific goal. 
the starting point of all achievement. Let us repeat. The starting point of all achievement is definiteness of purpose with PMA. Remember this statement and ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I really want? Based on the people we see in our PMA Science of Success course, we estimate that 98 out of every 100 persons who are dissatisfied with their world do not have a clear picture in their minds of the world they would like for themselves. Think of it. Think of the people who drift aimlessly through life, dissatisfied, struggling against a great many things, but without a clear-cut goal. Can you state right now what it is that you want out of life? Fixing your goals may not be easy. It may even involve some painful self-examination. But it will be worth whatever effort it costs. Because as soon as you can name your goal, you can expect to enjoy many advantages. These advantages come almost automatically. 1. The first great advantage is that your subconscious mind begins to work under a universal law. What the mind of man can conceive and believe the mind of man can achieve with PMA. Because you visualize your intended destination, your subconscious mind is affected by this self-suggestion. It goes to work to help you get there. 2. Because you know what you want, there is a tendency for you to try to get on the right track and head in the right direction. You get into action. 3. Work now becomes fun. You are motivated to pay the price. You budget your time and money. You study, think, and plan. The more you think about your goals, the more enthusiastic you become. And with enthusiasm, your desire turns into a burning desire. 4. You become alerted to opportunities that will help you achieve your objectives as they present themselves in your everyday experiences. Because you know what you want, you are more likely to recognize these opportunities. These four advantages are illustrated by an early experience of the man who was later to become editor of the Ladies Home Journal. Edward Bach came from Holland as a boy with his parents. He was imbued with the idea that someday he was going to run a magazine. With this specific goal before him, he was able to seize upon an incident so trivial that with most of us it would have passed unnoticed. He saw a man open a package of cigarettes, take a slip of paper from it, and drop the paper on the floor. Bach stooped and picked up the scrap of paper. On it was a picture of a famous actress. Below the picture was a statement that this was one of a series. The cigarette buyer was urged to collect the complete set of pictures. Bach turned the piece of paper over and noticed that the backside was perfectly blank. Bach's mind, filled as it was with a purpose, sensed an opportunity here. He reasoned that the value of the picture enclosed in the package of cigarettes would be greatly enhanced if the blank side were devoted to a brief biography of the person pictured. He went to the lithograph firm which printed the enclosure and explained his idea to the manager. The manager promptly said, I'll give you ten dollars each if you will write me a one hundred word biography of one hundred famous Americans. Send me a list and group them, you know, presidents, famous soldiers, actors, authors, and so on. This is the way Edward Bach got his first literary assignment. The demand for his short biographies became so great that he needed help, so he offered his brother five dollars each if he would help him. Before long, Bach had five journalists busy turning out biographies for the lithograph presses. Bach, he was the editor. You have success born in you. Notice that none of the men we have been talking about had success handed to him on a platter. At first, the world was not particularly kind to Edward Bach or Judge Cooper, and yet each carved from the raw material around him a career of great satisfaction, and each one did it by developing the many talents he found within himself. Everyone has many talents for surmounting his special problems. It is interesting to note that life never leaves us stranded. If life hands us a problem, it hands us also the abilities with which to meet the problem. Our abilities vary, of course, as we are motivated to use them. And even though you are in ill health, 
you can nonetheless lead a useful and happy life. You may fear ill health is too great a handicap to overcome. If this is true, take courage from the experience of Milo C. Jones. Milo had not tried to acquire wealth when he had good health, and then he became sick. When he became sick, the odds were stacked heavily against him. Here's the story of his experience. When Milo C. Jones had been in good health, he had worked very hard. He was a farmer, and he operated a small farm near Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. But somehow, he seemed unable to make his farm yield much more than the bare necessities for himself and his family. This kind of existence went on year after year. Then suddenly, something happened. Jones was stricken with extensive paralysis and confined to his bed. Here was a man who late in life became completely incapacitated. He was barely able to move his body. His relatives were certain he would be permanently unhappy as a hopeless invalid. And he would have been had not something more happened to him. And he made it happen. It brought the kind of happiness to him that comes with achievement and financial success. What was it Jones used to bring about this change? He used his mind. Yes, his body was paralyzed, but his mind was unaffected. He could think, and he did think and plan. One day, while engaged in thinking and planning, he recognized the most important living person with the magic talisman with PMA on one side and NMA on the other. He saw clearly that he was a mind with a body. He made his own decision right then and there. PMA Attracts Wealth Milo C. Jones chose to develop a positive mental attitude. He chose to be hopeful, optimistic, happy, and to convert creative thinking into reality by starting right from where he was. He wanted to be useful, and he wanted to support his family instead of being a burden to them. But how could he turn his disadvantage into advantage? He didn't let this vital problem stop him. He found the answer. First, Jones counted his blessings. He discovered that he had so very much for which to be thankful. This thankfulness led him to search for additional blessings which he might enjoy in the future. And because he was searching for, among other things, a way to be useful, he found and recognized that for which he was looking. It was a plan, and it required action. So Jones went into mental action. He revealed the plan to members of his family. I am no longer able to work with my hands, he began, so I have decided to work with my mind. Every one of you can, if you will, take the place of my hands, feet, and physical body. Let's plant every tillable acre of our farm in corn. Then, let's raise pigs and feed them the corn. Let's slaughter the pigs while they are young and tender and convert them into sausages. And then we can package and sell them under a brand name. We'll sell them in retail stores all over the country. And then he chuckled as he said, They'll sell like hotcakes. And they did sell like hotcakes. In a few years, the brand name Jones, Little Pig Sausages, became a household byword. And these four words became a symbol that tantalized the appetites of men, women, and children throughout the nation. And Milo C. Jones lived to see himself a millionaire. He had achieved something even more through a positive mental attitude, for he had flipped his talisman to PMA, and thus, although he was physically handicapped, he became a happy man. He was happy because he was useful. A Formula to Help You Change Your World Fortunately, not every life is faced with such great difficulties, yet everyone has problems and everyone reacts to motivating symbols through suggestion or self-suggestion. A most effective form is a self-motivator deliberately memorized for the purpose of flashing from the subconscious to the conscious in time of need. I Dare You What, then, is a formula that can help you change your world? Memorize, understand, and repeat frequently throughout the day. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. It is a form of self-suggestion. It is a self-motivator to success. When it becomes a part of you, you dare to aim higher.
Bill was a sickly farm boy in the southeastern Missouri country. A dedicated grammar school teacher motivated young William Danforth to change his world. The teacher did this with a challenge. I dare you. I dare you to become the healthiest boy in school. I dare you became William Danforth's self-motivator throughout life. He became the healthiest boy in his school. Before he died at the age of 85, he helped thousands of other youths to develop good health. And something more, to aspire nobly, to adventure daringly, and to serve humbly. During his long career, he never lost a day at work because of illness. I dare you, motivated him to build one of America's largest corporations, the Ralston Purina Company. I Dare You motivated him to engage in creative thinking and turn liabilities into assets. I Dare You motivated him to organize the American Youth Foundation. Its purpose is to train young men and women in Christian ideals and to prepare them for the responsibilities of life. I Dare You motivated William Danforth to write a book entitled, I Dare You. Today this book is inspiring boys and girls, men and women, to have the courage to make this world a better world to live in. What a remarkable testimony to the power of a self-motivator to develop a positive mental attitude. Are you yourself ever tempted to blame the world for your failures? If so, pause and reconsider. Does the problem lie with the world or with you? Dare to learn the 17 success principles. Dare to memorize self-motivators. Dare to apply them with the full assurance that they will work for you just as effectively as they are working every day for hundreds of others. Perhaps you don't know how. Perhaps you need to learn to think more accurately. Be guided by pilot number two. Then turn to chapter three. Its purpose is to help you clear the cobwebs from your thinking. Pilot number two. Thoughts to steer by. 1. You can change your world. To achieve anything worthwhile in life, it is necessary to set high goals for yourself and want to achieve them. Have you thought about the high goals you would like to achieve? 2. Imprint the 17 success principles indelibly in your memory. Have you memorized them? 3. Do you tend to blame the world? If you do, memorize the self-motivator, If the man is right, his world will be right. Is your immediate world right? 4. You were born to be a champion. For all practical purposes, you have inherited from the vast reservoir of the past all the potential abilities and powers you need to achieve your objectives. Are you willing to pay the price to develop your abilities and use the powers within you? 5. Identify yourself with a successful image, as Irving Ben Cooper did. Who will you select? 6. Ask yourself an important question. What will your picture say to you? Listen for the answer. 7. Definiteness of purpose with PMA is the starting point of all worthwhile achievement. Have you selected some definite, specific, desirable goal? Will you keep it in mind daily? 8. When you determine your definite aims, there is a tendency for several additional success principles to begin to operate automatically to help you achieve them. 9. Everyone has many talents for surmounting his special problems. What special talents do you think you have that you can develop? 10. Here is a formula that has helped many to change their world. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. Have you memorized this formula? A positive mental attitude and definiteness of purpose is the starting point toward all worthwhile achievement. Chapter 3. Clear the Cobwebs from Your Thinking You are what you think. But what do you think? How orderly are your thought processes? How straight is your thinking? And how clean are your thoughts? 
There are certain mental cobwebs that clutter up the thinking of almost everyone, even the most brilliant minds. Negative feelings, emotions, passions, habits, beliefs, and prejudices. Our thoughts become entangled in these webs. Sometimes we have undesirable habits and we want to correct them, and there are times when we are strongly tempted to do wrong. Then, like an insect caught in a spider's web, we struggle to get free. Our conscious will is in conflict with our imagination and the will of our subconscious mind. The more we struggle, the more we become entrapped. Some persons give up and experience the mental conflicts of a living hell. Others learn how to tap and use the powers of the subconscious through the conscious mind. They are victorious, and success through a positive mental attitude teaches you how to tap and use these powers. An insect may not be able to avoid being caught in the spider's web, and when once trapped, it is unable to free itself. There is one thing, however, over which each person has absolute inherent control, and that is his mental attitude. We can avoid mental cobwebs, we can clear them, and we can sweep them away as they begin to develop. We can free ourselves when once enmeshed, and we can remain free. You do this by accurate thinking with PMA. Accurate thinking is one of the 17 success principles revealed in Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude. To think accurately, you must use reason. The science of reasoning, or accurate thinking, is called logic. One can learn it from books written specifically on this subject, such as The Art of Clear Thinking by Rudolf Flesch, Your Most Enchanted Listener by Wendell Johnson, Introduction to Logic by Irvin Copey, and The Art of Straight Thinking by Edwin Levitt Clark. These books can be of immense practical help. But we don't act from reason alone. An action based on common sense is the result of more than just reason. It depends upon habits of thought and action, intuitions, experiences, and other influences such as tendencies and environment. One of the cobwebs of our thinking is to assume that we act from reason alone when in reality every conscious act is the result of doing what we want to do. We make decisions. There is a tendency when reasoning to draw conclusions favorable to the strong inner urges of our subconscious mind. And this tendency exists in everyone, even the great thinkers and philosophers. In 31 BC, a Greek philosopher who lived in a city on the Aegean Sea wanted to go to Carthage. He was a teacher of logic. Therefore, he contemplated reasons in favor of making the voyage and reasons against it. For every reason as to why he should go, he found that there were many more reasons why he shouldn't. Of course, he would be seasick. The boat was so small that a storm might jeopardize his life. Pirates with swift sailing vessels were lying in wait off Tripoli to prey upon merchant vessels. If his ship were captured by them, they would take his worldly goods and sell him into slavery. Discretion indicated that he should not make the trip. But he did. Why? Because he wanted to. It so happens that emotion and reason should be in balance in everyone's life. Neither should always hold the control in hand. So sometimes, it is good to do what you want to do instead of what reason fears. As to this philosopher, he had a most pleasant journey and arrived back home safely. Then there was Socrates, the great Athenian philosopher who lived from 470 B.C. to 399 B.C. He has gone down in history as one of the outstanding thinkers of all time. Wise as Socrates was, there were cobwebs in his thinking too. As a young man, Socrates fell in love with Xantippe. She was very beautiful. He wasn't good-looking, but he was persuasive. Persuasive individuals seem to have the ability to get what they want. Socrates was successful in persuading Xantippe to marry him. Are you seeing only the mote in the other fellow's eye? After the honeymoon was over, things didn't go along so well at his house. His wife began to see his faults, and he saw hers. He was motivated by egoism. He was selfish. She was always nagging him. 
Socrates reportedly said, My aim in life is to get on well with people. I chose Xantippe because I knew if I could get on well with her, I could get along with anyone. That is what he said, but his actions disproved his words. It is questionable that he tried to get on well with more than a few. When you always try to prove to persons whom you meet that they are wrong, you repel rather than attract as Socrates did. Yet he said that he endured Xantippe's nagging for his own personal self-discipline. But he would have developed real self-discipline had he tried to understand his wife and to influence her through the same considerate attentions and expressions of love that he used in persuading her to marry him. He didn't see the beam in his own eye, but he saw the moat in Xantippe's eye. Of course Xantippe wasn't blameless either. Socrates and she were just like many husbands and wives living today. After their marriage, they neglect to continue to communicate their true feelings of affection, understanding, and love to each other. They neglect to continue to employ the same pleasing personalities and mental attitudes that made their courtship such a happy experience. Negligence is a cobweb, too. Now, Socrates didn't read success through a positive mental attitude. Neither did Xantippe. Had she done so, she would have known how to motivate her husband so that their home life would have been a happier one. She would have seen the beam in her eye rather than the moat in Socrates. She would have controlled her own reactions and been sensitive to the reactions of her husband. In fact, she might have even proved the fallacy of his logic after she read Chapter 5, entitled, And Something More. And because the story of Socrates proves he saw only the moat in Xantippe's eye, we shall tell you about another young man. He learned to see the beam in his own eye. But before we do, let's see how the habit of nagging develops. You see, when you know the cause of a problem, you can often avoid it. Or you can find your own solution to that problem if you already have it. S.I. Hayakawa, in Language and Thought and Action, wrote, In order to cure what she believes to be her husband's faults, a wife may nag him. His faults get worse, so she nags him some more. Naturally, his faults get worse still, and she nags him even more. Governed by a fixated reaction to the problem of her husband's faults, she can meet it only one way. The longer she continues, the worse it gets, until they are both nervous wrecks. Their marriage is destroyed and their lives are shattered. Now what about the young man? It was the first evening of a PMA Science of Success class when he was asked, Why are you taking this course? Because of my wife, he responded. Many of the students laughed, but not the instructor. He knew from experience that there are many unhappy homes when husband or wife sees the other's faults, but not his or her own. He restored happiness to his home. It was four weeks later in a private conference that the instructor asked the student, How are you coming along with your problem? It's solved. That's wonderful. But how did you solve it? I learned, when I am faced with a problem that involves misunderstandings with other persons, I must first start with myself. When I examined my own mental attitude, I discovered that it was negative. My problem was really not with my wife after all. It was with me. In solving my problem, I found that I no longer had one with her. Now, what if Socrates had said to himself, When I am faced with the problem that involves a misunderstanding with Xantippe, I must first start with myself. And what would happen if you would say to yourself, When I am faced with a problem that involves a misunderstanding with another person, I must first start with myself. Would your life be a happier one? But there are many other cobwebs that interfere with happiness. Oddly enough, the one that is the greatest hindrance is the very tool of thought itself. Words. Words are symbols, as S.I. Hawakawa tells us in his book. And you will find that a one-word symbol can mean to you the sum total of a combination of innumerable ideas, concepts, and experiences. And you will also see, as you continue to listen to success through a positive mental attitude, that the subconscious instantaneously communicates to the conscious mind through symbols. Through one word, you can motivate others to act. 
When you say to another person, you can, this is suggestion. When you say to yourself, I can, you motivate yourself by self-suggestion. But more about these universal truths in the next chapter. First, let's recognize that a whole science has grown up around the important discoveries made about words and the communicating of ideas through words, the science of semantics. And Hayakawa is an expert in this field. He tells us that to find out what a word really means on the lips of another person, or even on your own lips, is essential in the process of accurate thinking. But how does one do this? Just be specific. Start with a meeting of the minds, and many needless misunderstandings will be avoided. One word can cause an argument. The uncle of a nine-year-old boy was visiting in the home of the boy's parents. One evening, when the father came home, the following dialogue developed. What do you think of a boy that lies? I don't think very much of him, and I know one thing certain. My son tells the truth. He told a lie today. Son, did you tell your uncle a lie? No, father. Let's clear this thing up. Your uncle says you lied. You say you didn't. Just exactly what did happen, he asked, turning to the uncle. Well, I told him to take his toys down to the basement. He didn't do it, and he told me that he did. Son, did you take your toys to the basement? Yes, father. Son, how do you explain this? Your uncle says that you didn't take your toys to the basement, and you say that you did. There are several steps leading from the first floor down to the basement. About four steps down is a window. I put my toys on the windowsill. The basement is the distance between the floor and the ceiling. My toys are in the basement. The argument between the uncle and his nephew was due to the definition of one word. Basement. The boy probably knew what his uncle meant, but he was lazy and hadn't wanted to run all the way downstairs. When he was faced with punishment, the boy tried to save himself by using logic to prove his point. Now this may be intriguing, but more motivating will be the story of a young man who didn't know what the most important word symbol in any language means. And what is the most important word in any language? That word is God. Not so long ago, a student from Columbia University called on the Rev. Harry Emerson Fosdick, Minister Emeritus of the Riverside Church of New York City. The student had hardly gotten through the door before he said, I am an atheist. When he sat down, he repeated defiantly, I don't believe in God. Let's start with a meeting of the minds. Now fortunately, Dr. Fosdick was also an expert in the field of semantics. He knew from long experience that he could never really communicate with another person unless he understood exactly what that other person meant by the words he used. He also knew that it was necessary for the other person to comprehend his meaning. So instead of taking offense at the student's brash remark, Dr. Fosdick expressed a genuinely friendly interest in him and then asked, Please describe to me the God you do not believe in. The young man had to think, as everyone has to think when he is asked a question that doesn't cause a reflex yes or no answer. Dr. Fosdick knew that the right question could sweep strong cobwebs of negative thinking out of the youth's mind. After a little while, the student began to try to describe the God he didn't believe in. In so doing, he gave the minister a very clear picture of the God he rejected. Well, said Dr. Fosdick when the student had finished, if that is the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in him either. So we are both atheists. Nevertheless, he continued, we still have the universe on our hands. What do you make of it? Its formation, its meaning. Before the young man left Dr. Fostick, he discovered that he was not an atheist at all, but a very good theist. He did believe in God. Now, Dr. Fostick had not been thrown by the undefined use of a word. In this instance, he helped sweep away the cobwebs of the young man's thinking by asking him questions. The simple, clear response as to what the young man didn't believe in was enough to allow a meeting of the minds. The second question directed the youth's thoughts into the proper channels. 
and it gave Dr. Fostick an opportunity to explain his meaning of the universal God. Frog Legs Taught Him Logic As we have seen, the student reached two entirely different conclusions. Each was based on a different premise. Cobwebs will interfere with accurate thinking and cause you to reach a wrong conclusion when you start with a false premise. W. Clement Stone had an amusing experience with this, which he describes as follows. As a boy, I enjoyed eating frog legs. One day at a restaurant, I was served jumbo frog legs and didn't like them. Then and there, I decided that I didn't like large frog legs. Some years later, I was at a quality restaurant in Louisville, Kentucky, and saw frog legs on the menu. My conversation with the waiter was as follows. Are these small frog legs? Yes, sir. Are you sure? I don't like the large ones. Yes, sir. If they're the small ones, that'll be fine for me. Yes, sir. When the waiter brought the entree, I saw that they were jumbo frog legs. I was irritated and said, These aren't the small frog legs. These are the smallest we could find, sir, the waiter responded. Rather than be unpleasant, I ate the frog legs, and I enjoyed them so much that I wish they had been larger. I learned a lesson in logic. In analyzing the matter, I realized that my conclusions about the merits of large and small frog legs had been based on the wrong premise. It wasn't the size of the frog legs that made them distasteful. It was the fact that the jumbo frog legs I had eaten the first time hadn't been fresh. I had associated my distaste for jumbo frog legs with size rather than with spoilage. Now we see that cobwebs prevent accurate thinking when we start with the wrong premise. So many persons think inaccurately when they allow all-embracing word symbols to clutter up their minds with false premises. Such words or expressions as always, only, never, nothing, every, everyone, no one, can't, impossible, either, or, are most frequently false premises. Consequently, when they are so used, their logical conclusions are false. Necessity plus PMA can motivate you to succeed. Now there is one word which, when used with PMA, motivates a person to honorable achievement. When used with NMA, it becomes the excuse for lies, deception, and fraud. Necessity is the word. Necessity is the mother of invention and the father of crime. Inviolable standards of integrity are fundamental to all worthwhile achievement and are an integral part of PMA. You will hear many success stories throughout this book in which persons are motivated by necessity. And in each case, you'll find that such persons achieve success without transgressing an inviolable standard of integrity. Lee Braxton is such a man. Lee Braxton of Whiteville, North Carolina, was the son of a struggling blacksmith. He was the tenth child in a family of twelve. So you might say, says Mr. Braxton, that I became acquainted with poverty early in life. By hard work, I managed to get through the sixth grade in school. I shined shoes, delivered groceries, sold newspapers, worked in a hosiery mill, washed automobiles, and served as a mechanic's helper. When he became a mechanic, it appeared to Lee that he had risen as far as he could go. Perhaps he had not yet developed inspirational dissatisfaction. In due course he married, and together he and his wife scrimped along. He was used to poverty, and it now seemed to him that it was impossible for him to break the ties which held him down, although he was poorly paid and just barely supporting his family. The Braxtons were already having a terrible time making ends meet, when to complete the picture of defeat, he lost his job. His home was about to be taken from him because he was unable to meet the mortgage payments. It seemed a hopeless situation. But Lee was a man of character. He was also a religious man, and he believed that God is always a good God. So he prayed for guidance. As if in answer to his prayer, he received the book Think and Grow Rich from a friend. This friend had lost his job and his home in the Depression, and he had been motivated to recoup his fortune after reading Think and Grow Rich. Now Lee was ready. 
He read the book again and again. He was searching for financial success. He said to himself, It seems to me there is something I have to do. I have to add something. No book will do it for me. The first thing I must do is develop a positive mental attitude regarding my abilities and my opportunities. I must certainly choose a definite goal. When I do, I must aim higher than I have in the past. But I must get started. I'll begin with the first job I can find. And he looked for a job and found one. It didn't pay much to start. But it wasn't many years after he had read Think and Grow Rich that Lee Braxton organized and became president of the First National Bank of Whiteville, was elected mayor of his city, and engaged in many successful business enterprises. You see, Lee had aimed high, in fact, very high. He had taken as his major purpose the goal of being rich enough to retire at the age of 50. He achieved this goal six years ahead of time. Retiring from active business with substantial wealth and a fine independent income at the age of 44. Today, Lee Braxton is leading a useful life. He is devoting his entire efforts to helping Oral Roberts, the evangelist, in his ministry. Now, the jobs that he took and the investments he made in climbing from failure to success are not important here. What is important is that necessity motivates a man with PMA to action without transgressing recognized inviolable standards. An honest man won't deceive, cheat, or steal because of necessity. Honesty is inherent in PMA. Necessity, NMA, and Crime Now contrast such a man with the many thousands of persons with NMA who are imprisoned because of stealing, embezzling, or other crimes. When you ask them why they stole in the first place, their answer invariably is, I had to and that's how they landed in prison. They allowed themselves to become dishonest because cobwebs in their thinking caused them to believe that necessity forces one to become dishonest. Some years ago, Napoleon Hill, while doing personal counseling in the prison library in the federal penitentiary at Atlanta, had several confidential talks with Al Capone. In one of these talks, the author inquired, How did you get started in a life of crime? Capone answered with one word, necessity. Then tears came into his eyes and he choked up. He began to tell of some of the good things he had done which the newspapers had never mentioned. Of course, these seem insignificant compared to the evil that is attributed to his name. That unfortunate man wasted his life, destroyed his peace of mind, undermined his physical body with deadly disease, and spread fear and disaster in the path he followed all because he never learned to clear the cobwebs of his thinking regarding necessity. And when Capone told of his good deeds, which he implied offset to some degree the wrongs he had done, he clearly indicated another cobweb which was preventing him from thinking accurately. While a man can neutralize the evil he has done by true repentance followed by a life of good deeds, Capone was not such a man. But there was such a man. He was a teenage problem child, yet his mother never lost hope even though many of her specific prayers for him seemed unanswered. And she never lost faith, regardless of her son's escapades or wrongdoing. He was a teenage problem child. This young man became an educated, intellectual, passionate, and sensual teenage problem child. He took pride in being first, even in evil. It is said that he disobeyed his parents and teachers, lied and deceived, committed petty thefts, cheated in gambling, indulged in alcoholic and sexual excesses. Yet because of his mother's constant and earnest pleas to him to mend his ways, he struggled to find himself even before he reached the lowest point in his moral life. Sometimes he was filled with shame by the knowledge that men with less education were able to resist temptations which he thought he was powerless to resist. And because he was educated, and because he was searching, he studied the Bible and other inspirational books of his day. Even so, he lost many battles with himself. And then one day he won the battle that turned the tide to personal victory. This is what happens when a person keeps trying. 
It was during a period of remorse when he was overcome with self-condemnation that he overheard a conversation in which one voice said, Take up and read. He reached for the nearest book, opened it, and read, Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. It often happens. After a person suffers a serious defeat in a personal battle with himself, he may at that point be ready. His remorse can be so emotional and sincere that he is motivated to take immediate action and through perseverance make the change that keeps him on the road to a complete victory. Now this young man was ready, and once he made his irrevocable decision, he had peace of mind. He believed that divine power would help him overcome the sins which he had previously fought in vain, and he developed a deep spirituality. His subsequent life proved this by results. The young man devoted himself to God and the service of his fellow men. It is because of what he had been and what he became that he is considered a man who has had a most powerful influence in giving hope even to the hopeless. Augustine was his name, and he was made a saint. It is well known that the power of the Bible has been instrumental in changing even the attitudes of human derelicts from negative to positive. And because of the special power in this written word, they were inspired to clear the cobwebs from their thinking. Thus they became clean in thought and habit. Many, like St. Augustine, have been moved to deep repentance, and like him, they have been motivated to devote their lives to the service of God and mankind, and many great evangelists climbed from these ranks. Now there are some good people of strong religious faith who also read their Bibles but say to us, Don't try to interfere with God, when we recommend other inspirational books. Cobwebs prevent them from trying to extract the good wherever it can be found. You don't try to interfere with God. Now these good people fear that it is sacrilegious to dare to explore the powers of the mind God has given them, to choose, to plan, and to control their future. Many books of inspiration are written to motivate the reader to direct his thoughts, control his emotions, and ordain his destiny. And they often help the reader to comprehend the truths of the Bible. This is true, for example, in such a non-fiction bestseller as The Power of Positive Thinking. In his book, Norman Vincent Peale endeavors to motivate the reader to better himself. To do so, he quotes directly from the good book in which such people do believe. Some of the quotations Dr. Peel uses, and which it would be wise to memorize, are, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. According to your faith, be it unto you. Faith without works is dead. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. If God be for us, who can be against us? Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. You have just seen several mental cobwebs as we have pointed them out to you. Some of these are, 1. Negative A. Feelings B. Emotions and C. Passions D. Habits E. Beliefs and F. Prejudices 2. Seeing only the mote in the other fellow's eye 3. Arguments and misunderstandings due to semantic difficulties 4. False conclusions resulting from false premises. 5. All inclusive, restrictive words or expressions as basic or minor premises. 6. The idea that necessity forces dishonesty. 7. Unclean thoughts and habits. 8. Fear that it is sacrilegious to use the powers of your mind. And so you see there are many varieties of cobwebs, some small, 
some large, some weak, some strong. Yet if you make an additional listing of your own, and then examine the strands of each cobweb closely, you will find that they are all spun by NMA. And when you think about it for a while, you will see that the strongest cobweb spun by NMA is the cobweb of inertia. Inertia causes you to do nothing, or, if you are moving in the wrong direction, keeps you from resisting or stopping. You go on and on. Ignorance is the result of inertia. That which seems logical to the person who is ignorant of the facts or know-how may be illogical to the man who does know. When you make decisions because you refuse to keep an open mind and learn the truth, that is ignorance. An NMA keeps alive and grows fat on ignorance. Eliminate it. Success through a positive mental attitude indicates clearly how you can eliminate it. The man with PMA may not know the facts or have the know-how. He may not understand. Yet he recognizes the basic premise that truth is truth and is not false regardless of his lack of knowledge or understanding. He therefore endeavors to keep an open mind and to learn. He must base his conclusions on what he does know, yet be prepared to change them when he becomes more enlightened. Will you dare to clear the cobwebs from your thinking? If your answer is yes, then let pilot number three guide you as you move forward into chapter four. You will be ready to see with an open mind. You will be ready to explore the powers of your mind. And when you do, your exploration will lead you to a great discovery. But only you can make it for yourself. Pilot number three. Thoughts to steer by. One. You are what you think. Your thoughts are evaluated by whether your attitude is positive or negative. Take a look at yourself. Are you one, a good person? Two, evil? Three, healthy? Four, psychosomatically ill? Five, wealthy? Six, poor? If you are, then one, you have good thoughts. Two, your thoughts are evil. Three, your thoughts are of good health. Four, your thinking makes you so. 5. Your thoughts are of riches. 6. Your thoughts are of poverty. 2. Negative feelings, emotions, passions, prejudices, beliefs, habits. You clear these mental cobwebs by turning your talisman from NMA to PMA. 3. You can clear the mental cobwebs of negative passions, emotions, feelings, tendencies, prejudices, beliefs, and habits by flipping your invisible talisman from NMA to PMA. You will learn how as you respond to what you hear in success through a positive mental attitude. 4. When you are faced with a problem that involves a misunderstanding with other persons, you must first start with yourself. 5. One word can cause an argument develop misunderstanding, generate unhappiness, and end in misery. One word with PMA, when compared to the same word with NMA, brings opposite effects. One word can bring peace or war, yes or no, love or hate, integrity or dishonesty. 6. Let's start with a meeting of the minds. When Dr. Fostig brought about a meeting of the minds, the young man himself concluded that he was not an atheist. He did believe in God. 7. Frog legs taught him logic. When you reason by inference, be certain that your major and minor premises are correct. 8. Such all-inclusive restrictive words as always, only, never, nothing, every, everyone, no one, can't, impossible, should be eliminated as premises in reasoning until you are certain that they are correct. 9. Necessity is the word. Does necessity motivate you to high achievement through your personal honesty and integrity, or does necessity motivate you to try to get results through deception or dishonesty? 10. A teenage problem child, 
you may know one. But don't give up hope. He may not become a saint, but someday he may make his world and your world a better world to live in. 11. Direct your thoughts, control your emotions, and ordain your destiny. Memorize and repeat frequently the self-motivators quoted from the Bible earlier in this chapter. 12. Learn to separate facts from fiction. Then learn the difference between important facts and unimportant facts. Direct your thoughts with PMA to control your emotions and to ordain your destiny. Chapter 4 Will you dare to explore the powers of your mind? You are a mind with a body. Because you are a mind, you possess mystical powers. Powers known and unknown. Dare to explore the powers of your mind. Why explore them? When you make the discoveries that are awaiting you, they can bring you 1. Physical, mental, and moral health, happiness, and wealth. 2. Success in your chosen field of endeavor. And even 3. A means to affect, use, control, or harmonize with powers known and unknown. And dare to investigate all non-physical forces lying outside the realm of known physical processes. Forces which you can use when you learn how to apply them. And this will not be so difficult for you. No more difficult than turning on a television set for the first time. For a little child can tune into his favorite television program. Now when he does, he neither knows the construction of the broadcasting station or his receiving set, nor the technology involved. But that's all right. For all the child needs to know is how to turn the right knob or push the right button. You will see in this chapter how you can turn the right knob or push the right button to get what you want from the most effective electrical machine ever conceived. Although this particular machine is the sublime handiwork of divine power, you own it. How is it made? Well, among other things, it is comprised of over 80 trillion electrical cells. Naturally, it has many component parts, and each part is in itself an electrical mechanism. And one part is an electrical marvel, yet it weighs only 50 ounces. Its mechanism consists of over 10 billion cells, which generate, receive, record, and transmit energy. What is this wonderful machine that you own? Your body. You are and will be the same you, even though you lose an arm, an eye, or other parts of your body. And the electrical marvel? Your brain and your nervous system. It is the mechanism through which your body is controlled and through which your mind functions. And your mind, it too has parts. One is known as the conscious and the other the subconscious. They synchronize. They work together. Scientists have learned a great deal about the conscious mind. Yet it has been less than a hundred years since we began to explore the vast unknown territory of the subconscious. Even though primitive man has deliberately used the mystical powers of the subconscious from the beginning of man's history. And even today, the aborigines of Australia and other primitive peoples do so to a very great extent. Let's start exploring now. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting richer and richer. Let's begin by accompanying Bill McCall of Sydney, Australia, on a journey from failure and defeat to success and achievement. It was at the age of 19 that Bill started a business of his own, Hides and Skins. He failed. At the age of 21, he ran for federal Congress, and again he failed. Now it seems that instead of crushing him, these and other defeats motivated this young Australian to develop inspirational dissatisfaction. So he began searching for rules of success. You see, Bill McCall wanted to become rich, and he thought he could find rules for acquiring wealth in inspirational books. Therefore, while checking the inspirational book section of the library, Bill became intrigued by the title, Think and Grow Rich. He borrowed the book and began to read. He read it once, and then he read it again. And even though he read it the third time, 
Bill McCall was unable to understand exactly how he could apply the principles whereby some of the richest men in the world acquired their wealth. He told us, I was reading Think and Grow Rich for the fourth time while walking leisurely along a business street in Sydney. And then it happened. It happened suddenly. I stopped in front of a meat market window and glanced up. And in that very fraction of a second, I had a flash of inspiration. He smiled as he continued. I exclaimed aloud, That's it! I've got it! I was startled at my emotional outburst. So was a lady who was passing by. She stopped and looked at me in amazement. I hurried home with my new discovery. He continued seriously. You see, I was reading Chapter 4, entitled Auto-Suggestion. The subheading was The Medium for Influencing the Subconscious Mind. Now I remember that when I was a boy, my father read aloud from Emil Coué's little book, Self-Mastery Through Conscious Auto-Suggestion. He then looked at Napoleon Hill and said, It was you who pointed out in your book that if Emile Coué was successful in helping individuals avoid sickness and in bringing the sick back to good health through conscious auto-suggestion, auto-suggestion could also be used to acquire riches or anything else one might desire. Get rich through auto-suggestion. That was my great discovery. It was a new concept to me. McCall then described the principles. It almost seemed as if he had memorized them from the book itself. You know, conscious auto-suggestion is the agency of control through which an individual may voluntarily feed his subconscious mind on thoughts of a creative nature, or, by neglect, permit thoughts of a destructive nature to find their way into the rich garden of his mind. When you read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money with emotion and concentrated attention, and you see and feel yourself already in possession of the money, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Let me say again, it is most important that when you read aloud the statement of your desire through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness, you read with emotion and strong feeling. Your ability to use the principles of auto-suggestion will depend very largely upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire until that desire becomes a burning desire. When I arrived home, out of breath for running, I immediately sat down at the dining room table and wrote, My definite major aim is to be a millionaire by 1960. Still looking at Napoleon Hill, he continued, you mentioned that a person should be specific as to the amount of money he wants and set a date. I did. Now the man to whom we were talking was not the young Bill McCall who failed at the age of 19. He became known as the Honorable William V. McCall, the youngest man ever to become a member of the Australian Parliament, as the former chairman of the board of directors of the Coca-Cola subsidiary in Sydney and as the director of 22 family-owned corporations. And as to riches, he became a millionaire, and quite as rich as some of the men he had read about in the book from which he got the inspiration to explore the power of his subconscious mind with self-suggestion. Incidentally, he became a millionaire four years ahead of schedule. Day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better. You will note we use the word self-suggestion as being synonymous with the term conscious auto-suggestion used by Emile Coué. McCall remembered that when he was a boy, his father had benefited from a great discovery found in a book of his day, a discovery that every man, woman, and child can effectively employ when he finds it for himself. Like Bill McCall and his father, you too can properly employ the power of conscious auto-suggestion. Now, conscious auto-suggestion was revealed to Emile Coué because he dared to explore the powers of his own mind and the minds of others. Before he made his great discovery, he used hypnosis to cure the physical illnesses of his patients. But after making his great discovery, which was in reality based on a simple natural law, he abandoned the use of hypnosis. And how did he find and recognize this natural law? 
Emile Coué's great discovery was made when he found the answer to some questions he asked himself. They were. Question number one. Is it the suggestion of the doctor, or is it the suggestion of the mind of the patient that affects a cure? Answer. Coué proved conclusively that it was the mind of the patient that subconsciously or consciously made the suggestion to which his own mind and body reacted. Without either unconscious autosuggestion or conscious autosuggestion, external suggestions are not effective. Question number two. If the suggestion of the doctor stimulates internal suggestion of the patient, why can't the patient use healthful, positive suggestions on himself? And why can't he refrain from harmful negative suggestions? The answer to his second question came quickly. Anyone, even a child, can be taught to develop a positive mental attitude. The method is to repeat positive affirmations, such as, Day by day, in every way, through the grace of God, I am getting better and better. Throughout success through a positive mental attitude, you will see many self-motivators which you can use for your own self-suggestion. And if by now you don't know how to use self-suggestion, you will before you complete this book.